all of these um, components, um, but we will ask you at the end of each little bit uh, to offer up things that you would like to, uh, obviously to uh, ask burning questions, but to offer up um, uh, areas that you would like uh, to ensure that we discuss uh, in particular. And uh, with, with that, I would like to hand over to my colleague, uh, Professor Leona Poon. Next slide, please. I have to good morning everyone. I have to grow taller so you can see me. So <laughs> thank you. Um thank you Laura and thank you for the great team, the ISSHP for bringing me here. It's is really an honor for me to be in this beautiful city. And uh, I will be very brief, and I don't actually have a clicker. Uh, may I have... Oh, you will click for me? Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, obviously, I'm very passionate about uh, prediction and prevention of career clumps, and I'm honoured to be part of this team to uh, develop the latest uh, guidelines. So I just want to highlight some um, uh, aspects uh, of controversies and, and, and where we're heading. So next. Uh, these are my disclosures. We can go on to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so let me start with prediction of pre Uh And next as well. So of, I have some animations, so I, I'm afraid you have to keep hearing me saying next. So um, this is uh, quite uh, well known. Uh, this slide uh, I've been presenting, Kipros has been presenting this slide over the world for many, many years. But then just to highlight where we were uh, uh, several years ago, many years ago, uh, with the, um, the, the NICE in 2010, developing, uh, uh, recognizing the need of uh, early, early prediction and coming up with a list of high risk factors and moderate risk factors. And then several years later in, in, in the United States, uh, ACOC also adopted a similar guideline. Uh, in 2018. Uh, this approach is very, very simple. As you know, you go through this checklist and you say that, okay, you have these risk factors and therefore you're at risk of preeclampsia. But then I, I would say that at that moment in time, we didn't have the evidence to tell me the screening performance. So we took, took the liberty of applying this screening approach in our uh, research population. And then you can see that uh, the screening performance um, is not as good as expected. For the detection, for the detection of term preeclampsia, uh, the detection rate is 30%. For preterm preeclampsia, the detection rate is better at 39%. So I think it is very important for us to recognize the limitation of this approach and then build on uh, and develop a better model. Next. Uh, so uh, this is uh, where my work has been focusing on, uh, developing a better model, combining a series of maternal factors with the measurement of uterine artery doppler on ultrasound, measurement of blood pressure, uh, and also um, uh, serum placenta growth factor. Uh, with this approach, we are able now uh, we're we're now able to achieve a detection rate of thirty percent, uh, ninety percent for the detection of early onset preeclampsia at a 10% false positive rate. And then for preterm preeclampsia, the detection rate is a little bit less at 75%. Nonetheless, this is already sufficient for us to provide effective prevention. And as for term preeclampsia, I think um, we're still not there yet, um, achieving only a detection rate of 45%. But then I think uh, there, there, there will be more and more research projects coming along to demonstrate that there are other methods of screening for term preeclampsia. Next. So um, back in 2018, uh, actually now still the case, uh, we do recognize that there isn't one single test that can achieve effective prediction of preeclampsia. And then uh, we came along and we demonst we've demonstrated that a combination of maternal factors with a series of biomarkers, uh, namely blood pressure, placental growth factor, neutral artery doctor, can select um, uh, a cohort of women who may benefit in particular from 150 <laughs> 150 milligrams of aspirin. So essentially, uh, the ISSHP recognize the better model, um, but we also recognize that the limitations in the model across the world. Because where we are is that we really want to push ahead with um, implementing uh, a first semester combined screening across across the globe. But we need to recognize the limitations of uh, clinical settings, etc. Next. 
Um, uh, women uh, should be screened for clinical risk factors uh, uh, of, uh, at the antenatal care booking. This is uh, essentially a good practice point. So I don't want to dwell, uh, dwell on these points, but then you can refer to the guidelines, but then highlight the fact that within our guideline, we also recognize previous history of prior percent abruption, prior still above, and prior fetal growth restriction and IVF. Next. So, um, and then uh, if testing is available, after appropriate counseling, then women should be screened at 11 to 14 weeks for preterm preeclampsia using a combination of uh, 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 clinical factors as well as the three biomarkers as mentioned as available, even, they, even, though, even if they have been already been identified as having clinical high risk factors. Next, I think I have a slide to explain why. Next, yes, the next. So here, uh, uh, based on many of you asking me a question, what if I have a woman with a strong risk factor based on the NICE approach, uh, and then uh, should we still screen her for preeclampsia using the triple test? So this is how I develop my research. You can ask me a question, I come up with a research idea, and I demonstrate to you the evidence. So I've divided the analysis according to NICE risk factors and ACOG risk factors. The top one is the ACOG risk factor table. And then if a woman is considered ACOG positive, the risk of developing preterm preeclampsia is about 1%. And if a patient is doubly positive, meaning uh -huh. ACOG positive uh -huh. and multiple uh -huh. test positive, then actually her risk is substantially increased to 4.8% uh, from a background risk of 0.7%. But then if a patient is ACOG positive and then the triple test negative, I can then substantially reduce her risk to 0.25%. Of course, there is never a, a no risk situation. But then a low risk is, is, is observed here, and, and we can achieve a relative reduction of 0 0.05. And applying the same approach for nice risk factors, and I think the high risk factors uh, uh, column is showing some uh, results as per ACOG. And as for moderate risk factors, we can also also reduce the risk substantially to 0.42%. So in my practice, if a patient has a high risk factor, I still go. Th I will still advise uh, individual screening because I want to see how her biomarkers are, and then advise her accordingly as to the need of aspirin prophylaxis. Next. Um, so just this is summarizing the different combinations because uh, I, I recognize that not everywhere can implement the triple test. I would say the Mercedes test. And then um, in my setting, I'm very lucky. I, I, I provide routine Down syndrome screening. I can easily add on uh, the measurements of placental growth factor because I take blood already for PAPE and 3 b cg I do a scan already for fetal nuclear translucency thickness. I add on 50 seconds to measure the uterine artery PI and then measure blood pressure as part of routine antenatal care. But then where you are if you don't have a uh, PLG readily available uh, certainly you can consider doing a scan adding uterine artery positivity index but then if you already have PAPE available okay now you can't afford a PLGF but then you can still add on PAPE work your way up and hopefully you can get the better model eventually with the data that to support um, the implementation of early screening with a combined test <laughs> next so uh, many of you would want to know the health economics. Uh, the number needed to screen is really something that will tell us the screening benefit. And if you refer to the diagram in the middle, uh, based on the aspirate data, the numbers needed to screen to prevent one case of all pre any onset preeclampsia, preterm preeclampsia, and early onset preeclampsia, 143, 250, and 400 respectively. If you focus on the preterm preeclampsia number needed to screen, that number is corresponding to the number needed to screen to prevent one case of early onset leading to GBS infection through universal screening. So that's 250. And on the left, you can see all the numbers needed to screen in relation to cancer prevention. And I, I would say that, you know, pre cancer, okay, it's not the same as cancer, but still the number that we are generating is very, very respectable compared to the thousands that we are seeing on the left side of, my, of the slide. Next. So briefly touch on prevention. Move up next. And then here, uh, the ISSHP recommends that women with strong risk, risk factors be treated ideally before 16 weeks, but definitely before 20 weeks, with 75 milligrams to 160 milligrams a day of aspirin, as studied in the randomized controlled trials. So we are giving flexibility wherever you are. We just, we because obviously when we develop guidelines, we don't just think of what happens in Hong Kong, what happens in London. We need to think of the rest of the world. 
So thank you. I have a clicker now, so well, I, can, I can move on. So here uh, you can see, um, unless uh, there are contraindications, and we should recommend exercising in pregnancy because I think this is a major issue of the last hundred years that women, pregnant women, they are put in bed and then they don't want to get out of bed on a daily basis. We need to really push them along. And then, uh, and if we have such a guide, uh, recommendation in our guidelines, I think that is a powerful message. And then, where uh, where women uh, with low dietary intake of calcium, then of course calcium supplementation should be recommended. And uh, right now, we're not recommending heparin, vitamin C, or E folic acid for pre preeclampsia prevention. And then. Uh, and of course, uh, we're recommending the use of low-dose aspirin uh, to be taken at bedtime, preferably before 16 weeks and discontinued by 36 weeks. And after multivariable screening, then, then the dosage of aspirin should be 150 milligrams. And after the screening, based on clinical risk factors and blood pressure, then, then we allow a range of aspirin at 100 to 162 milligrams. But the key is that the minimum dosage you should recommend is 100 milligrams. And of course, there, there's a dose response. The higher the dosage, uh, the better the, the um, treatment effects. So the, the evidence that has supported the, the write-up of these guidelines, of course, has come from the, uh, the ASPRE trial. I don't want to dwell on it. The dramatic results that you see that we're able to prevent early onset preeclampsia and preterm preeclampsia by 82% and 62% with a regime of a triple test uh, combined screening in the first trimester of pregnancy followed by aspirin prophylaxis, 150 milligrams. Then, a very important message to provide our highest women is the importance of compliance. Through our research, we've demonstrated that high level of compliance can actually give you the additional benefit of aspirin. And in high risk women without chronic hypertension, taking 90% or more of the aspirin tablets from 12 weeks to 36 weeks, we can achieve as high as 95% prevention of preeclampsia. So in terms of cost saving, uh, there's already increasing evidence to suggest that the approach to screening and then followed by aspirin prophylaxis um, uh, is cost effective. And then we have some nice data from Canada, from Australia, and from Israel, even recently from, from London as well. I've seen those data. So uh, to close, I think this must be my last slide, number needed to treat. Uh, again, this is something you asked me for. So you can see the numbers are all very respectable. Okay below 100 to prevent one case of preterm preeclampsia, we need to treat 38 high-risk women. And even for um, preventing other uh, placental complications, reducing the risk of small babies, the numbers needed to treat range from 16 to 30. And for preventing uh, perinatal death, the number needed to treat is 34. So I hope I have convinced you that uh, we developed these guidelines with, with uh, many aspects in our head that we would like to provide uh, an all-rounded approach to screening prevention. Thank you very much for your attention. Let's open, let's open for two questions at this time. Anyone, any question or any comment on how prevention works in your scenario, the challenges? Yeah, I have a question. Do you, do you think we need a separate guidelines for the low socioeconomic countries? Uh, because in a place where we have, let's say, thousand women coming in, uh, screening with all the modalities is just not possible. The cost is prohibitive. So what would be the alternative? Can I have my slide back? Or can you put the slides back up for me? Yeah, and then can I go back? Camera. So this is why um, we have yeah. options. Yeah. We like options, yeah. don't we? So this is how I, I we, we came about FIGO, ISSHP, and we develop our guidelines with, with the whole world in our mind. Yes, it's not like we have to do the triple test everywhere. We need to build a model um, and starting from maternal factors with blood pressure. So right now our recommendation is that you start with that and if possible you could consider second tier screening. You could say that you screen 100% of pregnant women with the combined, well, the, but the double test, well single test, blood pressure with uh, maternal factors and maybe then you would say that 30% of these high-risk women will move on to the second tier screening. Uh, the second tier screening could be PLGF, uh, with or without uterine artery doppler or vice versa, depending on where you are. And then uh, ideally, of course, I would like to, to do the triple test. And I have also demonstrated, I will show some data that PAPE cannot really replace PLGF. It's, it's, it's 
I wouldn't even say it's an okay alternative. I gain 1% detection rate if I add Pape. So you decide tomorrow, I'll show you some data. And then you know what I mean. So uh, I think you, we can be deluded to thinking that we can use Pape, but right now um, it's okay. We can say that we borrow a test from the Down syndrome screening, but actually the incremental value of Pape is minimal. So you can start with that. And, and we've demonstrated nicely that contingent screening is, is possible. Uh, whereby you, 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 you basically identify a smaller group of women needing second tier screening. Um, and I think so between history the taking, the slides, blood pressure uh, measurement, then, uh, if you can't do it here, I don't know who can, can do it. Better, no. So, um, and also, we've also been quite pragmatic in terms of how we measure blood pressure. The ideal scenario is whereby you measure blood pressure simultaneously in both arms to get the best value to, uh, for mo and most people. You know. don't underestimate the use of blood pressure. Because that is one marker that has been very strong in our model, very, very tight SD, very reliable. And so and this is something we do on a daily basis in our, um, you know, antenatal clinic. So I think this is something you must incorporate within your risk assessment. And then we, although that's the best practice approach, double, you know, both arms simultaneously. But we're also recommending that you can use, you measure in one arm, but then you must at least measure twice. Because the first measurement is, is really not reflecting the woman's blood pressure. You need to measure it twice because the first measurement is higher. And I don't think a high measurement is going to be able to differentiate the at-risk women from the normal test of women because the, sep the separation of, um, of the two groups is very, very, very small. Whereby, if you measure the second time, uh, you account for that stress level. Because for me, a high blood pressure in a clinical setting is, well, you can say it's white cohypertension, but not quite there because it's not exactly hypertension. But that degree of stress level is has to be accounted for and when you measure blood pressure again a second